All right, everyone, welcome back. This is World with Ty Brownlow. I am your host, Ty Brownlow. And today I have a very special guest on my show. But before we get into that, let me just tell you, hey, World with Ty Brownlow, no one is worthless. No story is worthless. And let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. I have four words, graduate, corporate, consultant, and author, which is why they're here. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Latoya Pearson. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. you. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. You know, trying to survive in these times here. And yes. um, you're here today to talk about um, your book. Your book is called Seven Step Transition. It is a best Yes. Okay. Yes. Show that book. Show, man, for the people out there, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be a very good show because this book is pretty much about what's going on out here and what this show pretty much stands for. So, yes. um, let's talk a little bit about this book. You know, you okay. have five virtual tips when it comes to interviewing for high school graduates and also for college graduates. Yes. Um, first and foremost, let me ask, why focus on those two um, areas? Well, initially I was focusing just on college students because I am in corporate and I was running into students, interviewing students that were just not prepared for the transition. So it had nothing to do with their resume, had nothing to do with their experience. They were just not ready and prepared to deliver the message in a, in a corporate way. So I initially created the steps in the book to help college students find their way not only into the corporate world or whatever career they were looking for but mainly just understanding how to talk about themselves and not be so uncomfortable with it um, and then i started working with high school students just to help them understand um, how to get into college how to start looking into their careers and really trying to save themselves and their parents some money by not switching majors and understanding you know which colleges to go to which ones to apply for you know write that the entry level essay all of those things as well so that's that's where i started and, and i just feel like those two groups of people they um in my opinion need the most guidance because you know, they, they aren't as exposed to, to certain things. And they don't know, honestly, between you and I, Ty, they don't know the game yet. So, um, <laughs> and so they need someone there to teach them and make sure they don't make some of the mistakes that we made as we were transitioning. Yeah. So to your point, I just want to tell this quick story because everything that you're talking about is just bringing back flashbacks. And I remember my first corporate job out of college uh-huh. While on one end, I thought I was the man, you know, don't get me wrong, walking around corporate, hey, 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 you know, you know. But on the other end, um, I really wasn't mentally prepared for what was to come. And, mm -hmm. you know, when the transition and everything happened, it just left me at a certain point. So to that, I'm going to ask, what is one of the main things you find that, you know, youth and um, college graduates run into when you're talking about them getting out here and starting their career? Yeah, the I would say one of the top challenges or hurdles college students face as they're transitioning um, is the ability or lack of the ability to interview and talk about themselves um, in a corporate way. So when you're talking in an interview, it's different from having a conversation with your friends. Um, and even though you have this great curriculum in school, you aced all your classes, you did all these internships, none of that truly prepares you on how to actually interview for the job. So I see that lots of times that is the, the gap um, for a lot of students as they start to transition and they understand like, oh man, I have to actually talk about myself in a way that I'm not as comfortable with. Um, and, and they may not even recognize it or even understand that it's an opportunity almost until it's too late, um, unfortunately. So that's why I, I, you know, I try to get them ahead of time. And then once they actually transition into the career, 
I find that one of the biggest challenges, and that's why I call this the seven step transition, is that actual transition. So I'm in sales, I hire sales reps, they're out on their own. My biggest hurdle with um, hiring you know, college graduates and putting them out on their own is, are they going to wake up on time? Are they going to actually make it to the job? Um, You know, exactly, because they're on their own. And, um, you know, it it really is, I really have to find folks that are, you know, ready to grind and hustle and ready to kind of drive the business and understanding those competencies. But um, so I would say those two things, mainly for me, I feel like the gap is interviewing. And once they actually understand how to talk, talk about themselves in a corporate manner, then they're good. But no one, no one really teaches them that in college. Okay, well, let's talk about some of these tips that we have here. Okay. Um, I have, um, when it comes to the top five virtual tips. Um, yes. Basically, you talk about noise control, of course, so that's first and foremost, because in this day and age, um, the traditional interview, that will be a totally different story than what we're having now, but with COVID right. and the way the world has changed, this is now the new way of communication. So one of those tips of yours is, of course, you know, making sure that you have everything in the background secure and proper, correct? Correct. And and the reason I wanted to come up with some virtual tips is because I don't want to, I want students to also understand that, you know, everything that I would suggest or give advice on how to prepare for a regular face-to-face interview, most of those things would still stand, right? So um, just because it's virtual, you know, doesn't mean that yeah, you, you can be late, you know, or that sort of thing. So some of those things I didn't include in the virtual tips, but um, I, I wanted to make sure that they understood that, you know, these things happen no matter if it's face-to-face or virtual. But one of the main things, because I've conducted several virtual interviews at this point, and you'd be surprised of the things that's going on in the background or posters on the wall or, yes. you know, just things that you don't necessarily think about when you're, you know, setting it up until you actually get on camera and you're looking at yourself and seeing what's behind you. So, I mean, even in the bedroom, unmade beds and just, you know, those types of things, so. Well, in speaking with that, first and foremost, um, besides background being clear and clean, presentation. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the Mm -hmm. same way I'm dressed, preparing for this interview today with you, I feel, or you feel the same way should apply when you're out here applying to, you know, these corporate jobs. Um, Now, I will say this. I'm out here in L.A., all right? So I'm out here on the West Coast. Um, People have the tendency to be a little bit laid back. You know, it's a little bit more lax here. And um, I've noticed when I've seen certain people go on interviews, they're not dressed like this. You know, yeah. more of a T-shirt, maybe a blazer, yeah, or like a jacket or what have you. So, yeah. um, why it's why is it very like important for the dress to be professional from head to toe? So I think it's important to be professionally dressed, especially if you're not familiar with the culture of that organization. So some organizations are more relaxed, right? So they have more of a casual. Um, you know, attire uh, requirement. Even though that's the case, most of them still would expect you to show up professionally dressed because most of the time you're not going to know that. You're not going to know that that's their culture or, um, or, or even understand how they view their candidates that are coming in. So I always say err on the side of, you know, caution and just be just dress professionally no matter what because guess what no one's gonna say oh my goodness um you know he had on a suit and a tie or or he had on a a blazer and a tie you know no one's gonna say that but how uncomfortable is it to be in an in an interview and you're underdressed like immediately it 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 totally gives sends the a message to the interviewer and you haven't even opened your mouth yet so I would say just to avoid all of that, be sure you're dressed professionally. And that's one thing you won't even have to worry about. Okay, all right, all right. Um, another key point is testing your computer or electronic device to oh. ensure that, <laughs> A, 
it works and it is compatible because you know this is very important this is pretty much your livelihood at stake and yeah. um you say at least two days prior to the interview yeah so i said two days because it gives you a chance to troubleshoot so it could be something on your end it could be a firewall um but what i'm finding is that students will literally click on the link for the first time five minutes before the interview and then my phone's ringing like i can't get in and, and, and you know it's just you don't want to be in that situation you don't you know you don't want to be late for your interview or even cause your interviewer to have to help you troubleshoot or whatever that is um just trying to get the technology piece to work so because we're in this virtual world and that was my first tip because I've, I've actually had this happen a few times because we're in this virtual world now we have to think about the technology things and sometimes technology doesn't work and we don't know why it has a mind of its own like it was just working you know a day ago or whatever and now it's not so I always say test the links out make sure they're make sure they're working make sure it takes you to the right place um, and then make sure you have some type of contact information for someone a technical person from that company and say hey listen if something happens who should I call um, to, to help you out so okay all right um those are very good tips because listen we are talking about high school and college graduates anywhere from the age of 17 maybe to 22 you know yeah. give or take or what have you but um i just remember being those ages and i remember like when i was done with college and what i thought in my mind life should be like but versus reality that mm -hmm. just wasn't what it was so right. um these are very good tips, and I believe it's a mindset, too, that you yes. have to drill into them because this isn't high school. This okay. isn't college. You just can't show up 15 minutes late, you know, to work like you can do to class sometimes and just be like, hey, man, uh, I need those notes or, you know, hey, you know what? What was he talking about 15 minutes before I got in here? So, no, like, that just can't happen. And, uh, I, man, I think that is very, very yeah. Um, I have a very, man, the fifth tip, very important. Um, look into the camera while speaking and listening. Yes. Please specify why this is. Um, oh my goodness. The <laughs> worst thing. So you're already in a virtual environment. It's already kind of, you know, iffy with the connection because the whole point of an interview is you're trying to connect with the interviewer. You want to try to make some type of connection through the interview. So hopefully um, you're winning them over as far as them offering you the job. So the whole point is to get in there and make a, a connection. But if you're not looking in the camera when they're speaking to you or when you're speaking, how do you make that connection? And I put that on there because the, our, our young our young people these days um, they 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 already struggle with eye contact um, and that's in the face to face world. So I tell them if you look into the camera, maybe you don't have to necessarily look at the person or at the screen, um, but it, it at least brings in like that you're engaged in their conversation or what they're saying. And then when you're talking, it gives them an opportunity to truly connect with you. So for me, I think that is the only way that you can truly kind of build something and build some type of connection through the, you know, through the virtual interviewing. And a lot of people miss this one because um, they're just, you know, looking here and, you know, looking down and it, it just, they, they totally miss that. So let me ask, could there also be a lack of confidence? It could be. It definitely could be, which is why I talk about in the book in step four, I talk about preparing. And in the preparation stage, you should be doing some type of video recording of yourself to see, you know, where are you looking? And, you know, how are, how, how are you making eye contact and that sort of thing? Or when you role play, I, I suggest doing that with a family member or friend, look at them and then let them give you feedback and say, okay, did I have good eye contact? You know, um, how was I throughout the, you know, throughout the interview? So I, I truly believe that interviewing takes preparation. Like no one is gonna just walk in and be just, you know, 
I got this. But when you prepare, if you take the time to truly practice those things, practice looking at people when you're talking, practice looking at them when, when they're speaking to you, um, it, it, it becomes a little more natural when you get actually into the interview. Okay, all right. Hey, uh, key points, people. Young people, these are very key points. Like, this is gospel that she's speaking to you. Please, take these points and heed them. Uh, before I get into Miss Latoya, okay. let's talk a little bit more about this book. So, okay. um, what has been the reception of this book? Like, how do, like, the high school graduates and college graduates grasp to this book? Like, what is their response? So the mostly the the connection has come with the college students because it's really the audience I was shooting for when I was writing the book. Uh, it's 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 where I have the most experience with interviewing um, is with college students. So they grasp it way more than than the than the high school students. There's just more things in there for the college students. So. Um, the main thing that I preach in the book and the ones that I, I find it's like an aha moment for the college students when they're reading through it or when we're um, um, talking through it um, is the, the step four part is about how they prepare and how they prepare for the answer, uh, how to answer questions. Um, we talk through um, the main thing that really helps them in this book that I kind of give away is how to get through an interview um, and not get stuck on a question. Because I think everybody's been in an interview and they're like, mm, I get stuck. Because the interviewer asks you something, you're like, I have no clue how to answer this question. <laughs> and then what you start doing, and most people, they start, you know, being creative, making up something, you know, or, and, but, but what happens is when you do that, most of, most people that's been interviewing for a while, they, 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 they catch on really quickly but because you're talking and thinking at the same time. And most people in order to craft a really good story, I mean, you gotta be really good at it um, to get past people. But most people, when they're thinking and talking at the same time, um, it's a very broken, dialogue and you're pausing and then you start again and then you pause and then next thing you know you're talking about something that has nothing to even do with the question that was asked yeah so <laughs> so that's one of the things that really gravitates and um, my college students really pick up with it it's, it's um, a technique that I teach them on how to never get stuck how to always have um, an example ready and it's called what I call an example box um, and they have a list of all of their experiences on like an index card. And in a virtual world, you can have it, you know, on a billboard behind you, you can have it wherever. But um, in the face-to-face -face environment, I would have them put it on just a small index card and just tuck it inside of their portfolio. So when the interviewer asks them a question, they literally just go this. And every example, they should be able to tweak and um, be able to answer a question, any question thrown at them, if they've done their research. So if they've done the research on the company, they've done the research on the job position that's being offered, um, and they understand what skills that the company's looking for, mm -hmm. then they should that they should have everything they need in that in that example box. And so that is probably the one thing. If I, if I it, it, when people get the book or when I take them through it, I'm like, if you don't get anything else from this, this is what I want to help you with. I want to help you to be able to get through an interview without saying, I don't have an answer to that question. Now, that is very important. And I, man, you know, I'm just drawing on my own personal experiences here uh, <laughs> because I remember sitting in an interview and like the first time when someone told me, hey, tell me about yourself. And very basic question. Um, but as you said before, you're not used to talking about yourself. But then when you're used to, well, then when you figure, well, okay, do they want to know? Well, I went to high school here and you know, I on track, I played baseball, I did this. You know, I like Star Wars movies and no, they don't want to hear about that. They want to hear how can you be a, a pillar to the company? Yep. yep. How can it, man, how can we rely on you? Can you give us examples of that? And it took me a while 
and um, I think even sometimes with people who may have had a job in college, you know, maybe a part-time job or whatever, where they were like a little manager or, you know, assistant manager or what have you, um, sometimes they forget to rely on those experiences because when these corporate guys are asking you these questions, well, can you tell us about a time when you had to use, you know, this type of like technique to inspire or to motivate or to do this, you know, that stumps a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So um, I think a lot of times we have those experiences. We just don't know that those are the, ex those are the actual experiences yeah. that we're, you know, that companies are talking about. Yeah. And, you know, your class and, you know, your, um, well, I shouldn't say class, but, you know, your workshops and how you prepare these kids, that's very key going Yeah. Forward, especially for the college uh, graduate. Yes. Yes. But I want to talk one more thing about being prepared, real quick. Okay. Okay. And I just, once again, college experience, get to that senior year. Okay. I've been a psychology major all this time. Psych, 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 psych. Hey, psych, man, I'm going to get this degree. You know, it's going to be all good. I'm going out here to the field. I'm going to make a difference in the world. Graduation day rolls around, you sitting there, you like, man, I don't know now, you know, I really wanted to change the world three weeks ago. Now I'm not so sure about changing the world now. I, what am I gonna really do? Um, is there anything about doubt when you prepare for a certain position in your mind? Because I know a lot of times I've seen it, you've seen it as well, where, you know, kids or people may go in for a degree or you know a field but when they come out they don't even work in that field they work in something totally different and basically it's like well man i should have went to school for that instead of this how can you help those who have come to that for yeah yeah man you're hitting off some good stuff here so in the book the first step is about assessments and connecting your passion with your skills and talent. And because my goal was to uh, eliminate that happening, right? Because I met so many students that it happened to where they got all the way to senior year and they were a biology major and they're like, what am I gonna do now? Like, what, what do I do with a biology degree? So yeah. what I wanted to do is, that's how I started the book. I wanted to start with, helping students to understand their true passion like what are you really really passionate about and a lot of times i mean they're they're young most of them don't really know um so i take them through a series of assessments to help them get there um and then i start to just ask them little things about things that they like to do or maybe they watch tv shows and they're like this really interests me and so i kind of put that together to help them you know th through their uh college career so when they get to the senior year they don't have that but if I pick them up on senior year and this is what we have here um, they, they're in this situation they don't really know what they want to do um, I have them do something Ty called shadowing and I connect them I, I ask them so if you were a psych major I may connect you with and say okay I know you're a psych major but what do you want to do if you said hey I'm a psych major but you know, I, I, I think I think I may have something for you know technology or I think I because I like to do this or I like to play video games or I think I may have a niche for sales because I was you know a top salesperson at Best Buy um, doing my college job so I may get you um, into shadowing just for like you know a few months where you go to different companies you sit with someone for an hour or two just to see what they're doing um, and then that really helps students to understand Okay, I got this psych degree, that's not what I want to do. Or I got this degree, that's not what I want to do. So that's kind of how I help them. Um, unfortunately, most students, when they get to senior year and they're in that situation, they usually just take the first job that they get. And they just, you know, they just keep, keep going down and, until they find something that they really like. But what I'm finding is that they just start interviewing for all kinds of jobs and then whoever gives them the first offer, that's usually what they go for. Um, but you know, unfortunately, that's 
I've seen it happen time and time again. Um, and that's, you know, as I said, that's the real unfortunate part of things. But um, I thank you for all this knowledge that you are. <laughs> okay? I mean, no, like this is, this, man, this is a major key, as the kids would say. This is a major key, you know, and um, everything that you have spoken on helps them, you know, achieve and go on to the next level. Yeah. Um, but I want to talk about Miss Latoya Pearson for a second. Okay. You know? Okay. Like, I'm, you know, so this show, as I said, no one is worthless. No story is worthless. You got a story here, Miss Latoya Pearson, and I'm going to tie this into what it is that you're doing. Okay. okay. First and foremost, you are from is Gainesville, Florida. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Gainesville. Okay. All right. Gainesville in the house. What's up, everybody in Gainesville? <laughs> um, but you got your um, BS at Florida A and M. Yes, go Rattlers. All right. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. I'm gonna read some things here, but we're gonna come back to this HBCU in a second. Here. Okay. Right. Okay. About that and how that ties in to your book. So mm -hmm. just give me one second. All right. So you go to Florida A&M, graduate from there, get your BS in business administration. So that's how you get into the corporate field, correct? Yes, yes. Right. Uh, man, also during that time, you got your master's. Uh, mm -hmm. You managed hundreds of millions of dollars for corporations. Um, man, that led you into mentoring college and graduate students as they transition into their career. And you ended up launching your book, which is a self-help guide for students looking to enter the corporate world. And on top of that, it is a bestseller, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. So <laughs> let me just tell you, we just don't have anybody on this show. We got bestsellers. <laughs> uh, these are very key accolades, you know. And uh, man, first and foremost, I want to go to this HBCU. Yes. You went to Florida A and M. Yes. First and foremost, let me just say, I love HBCUs. Unfortunately, I ended up going to Illinois State University, which is not an HBCU, but that's a story for another okay. day. Uh, um, but lately, there's been a lot of talk about HBCUs um, mm -hmm. in the academic. I mean, not in the academic, but in the sports side of things. Yes. But I want to focus on the academic side of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's always been this little stigma behind HBCUs that I personally feel is not deserved because I have family who, who have graduated from HBCUs and it, as far as I know, they're more successful than other family who have not graduated from HBCUs. <laughs> so give us a little insight, you know, on what life was like at the HBCU and how that prepared you coming out of college going into the corporate world. Listen, Florida A&M University saved me, mm. changed my life. And I would not be here today without Florida A&M University. I'll just say that to start off. Um, now, we were in a situation where right across the railroad tracks was Florida State. So you got a PWI and it's right next door to us. So there were always comparisons. So you want to talk about academic, I mean, we, we talk about the sports thing too, but from the academic standpoint, um, our curriculum, so, you know, several students would transfer between schools. And our engineering school was um, both Florida State and FAMU. So it was just one school shared by both. Um, but you had students, and I had friends even, that transferred, went left FAMU, went to Florida State, or, or vice versa, um, because the schools were so close together, and you're in Tallahassee, you know, make it work with one of them. But the one thing that I consistently heard was that the classes were harder at FAMU than they were at Florida State. Really? Exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. And Exactly. And... Um, of course, FAMU is going to have smaller class size. So we had professors that were like our parents. They were, you know, 
on us about being be, getting to class on time. They would not let us fail. I have a professor, I had a professor that I still talk to to this day and I graduated, I was in school 20 years ago and I still talk to her because she had such an impact on my life. Um, and that is something that you talk to people that went to Florida State or just any other PWI, you don't hear that story very often. Um, and it wasn't just one professor. I mean, you've got professors every year that once you take their class, they're they're calling you. Okay, how are you doing? What grade do you have here? Okay, I'm going to help you get a tutor in this. I'm going to come to my office. You know, so it was it was almost like we were their children, and they would not they they did not um, let us fail. That it was like something that, and it was like something we all knew as well. So once we took one professor, you talk to some of the other cl- upperclassmen and like, oh yeah, when you take professor such and such, don't worry, you know, she won't let you get away with this or that. And so I was from Gainesville, Florida. I wasn't exposed to um, a lot of corporate um, people. You know, um, my, my, my parents didn't go to college. So I didn't have um, those examples, at least not as, not a lot of them. So when I had the FAMU and I had these professors that were preparing me for this corporate world that I had never been a part of before, that's what I mean by I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for FAMU. And that's what they do. They, they, they take students in and they truly transform you. Um, to a place where you can be successful and, and not just in um, you know a black environment but in any corporate corporate world so and that's another thing that I hear folks that didn't go to an HBU say that or HBCU they'll say oh well you know you should want to be around everybody because when you get out into the working world you've got to be able to um, you know, be able to work with everyone. I'm like, don't worry. We learned that in HBCU as well, because guess what? HBCU is just not black people. There's, there's, there's white folks there. There's all types of black people too. I mean, you've got, you know, black folks from all over the world sure. going to these. So it's, it's like, you still, you're still not um, in an environment where it's just one kind. Um, and so I just feel like um, I, it, it was such an eye opener, even for myself, freshman year, being on that campus and feeling like this was my family. Like there was there was just this sense of family um, from from the day we stepped on campus, um, and we still have that today. I know people say things about FAMU and that we're almost like a cult, and I'm like, I, you can call us whatever you want to call us, but we stick together for hey, sure. Look, okay, I'm gonna say this. I was all about the swag and this and the other. You know, I had people that went to Alcorn, they went to Jackson State, they went to Valley State. Yeah. Um, so I hear this all the time, you know. Yeah. So your Rattlers, I know the bands, man. <laughs> you gotta tell me about all that. I know, the, trust me, I am school when it yeah. comes to HBCUs, especially, you know, in the South. So, yeah. Uh, but no, I think that's cool. Like, I really think that is like very, very cool because nine times out of 10, and it's not that you're not trying to help other people, but when you're out here in these workshops and you're looking at these faces, most of these faces look like you and I. Yes. And I mean, if we remember what it was like being that age and coming out and having the same worries, then why not give you the skills and tips to help get you, you know, further you know, than what I did when I came in. And like you said before, yeah, make the same mistakes that I made. Yep. Okay, all right. Yep. So, Ms. Pearson, this brings us to our last question. The question that this show is known for, we are founded on this question. So I have to ask it. Ms. Latoya Pearson, what is the one word that best describes you and why? <sighs> One word, ooh, just one, okay. One word, I would say, hmm. I think I'm going to go with perseverance. And the reason I'm gonna say that is because um, if you knew my background and just where I came from, the only way I got here was that I, I, I never gave up. And, and, and it was, 
lots of people along the way that continue to push me and, and help me get here, but I'm not a best-selling author, you know, by chance, right? I mean, there was some some work and, and some pushing and not never giving up and um, all of those things kind of bundled together because I have a message and I want every college student out there to know that, you know, it doesn't end there. Um, you know, they're getting no's every now and then, especially in this virtual world where, you know, folks are getting laid off or furloughed and that sort of thing. Um, but my, my passion was to be sure that I never gave up on the young, on our youth and making sure that they knew that if, if it's not the seven steps, um, any type of resource that I have is theirs. Um, and so, so I, I would say perseverance because uh, I'm, I'm not giving up. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push through. Okay. Hey, you know what? Hey, I will call you a champion. That's my fun <laughs> word for you. Okay. So if I like, if you're gonna ask me, I'm gonna go with champion because uh, your cause is very noble, and I mean you're doing something very like constructive and positive for the community. You know, you're paying it forward, as my friend and say, boy, pay it forward. So, uh, yes. but but no, you are. Uh, you are paying it for it, and that's very noble. So the things that I said before, being a graduate, working in corporate, being a consultant, being an author, all these things tie in to who you are, and you have persevered. So and you're going to keep on fighting a good fight. So, yes. man, um, if anybody out there needs to get in contact with you for a workshop or, you know, just to hear more about your book or to like, get you to, you know, speak at a public event, how can they get in contact with you? Uh, my website is uh, sevensteptransition.com. Um, so you can reach me there. I'm also on social media platforms at under seven step transition as well. Um, so all of those things um, can can lead you right, right here to me. I, um, you know, would love to talk to any college students, but I, I, I mostly work with schools and their career development department. Um, and so their career services or that sort of thing. Um, so really that's where, that's where um, I find myself these days is, is working with, with those particular folks. And that way I, I can cast amongst their entire student population, so. She's smart, y'all. Smart woman over here. All right. <laughs> so on that note, um, this is Work with Ty Brownlow. I am Ty Brownlow. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram. Um, I'll, you can also find me on YouTube, all under Work with Ty Brownlow. And you can also follow me on LinkedIn at just Ty Brownlow. But you can go to my website, which is tybrownlow.com, and get all of this knowledge we have here today, plus other interviews. I want to thank Miss. Harrison for coming out because man seven step transition get it get it get it now all right man <laughs> we're with Ty Brownlow remember no one is worthless no story is worthless we out peace thank you thank you